You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host and bourbon soak storyteller, Juliet Miranda. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda, and welcome to episode 242 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. I have a bourbon soak story for you today about rocky relationships and love at first exhale. But first, You know me, y'all. I need to suck down some bourbon. Cheers. (sighs) Oh, lovely bourbon. (laughs) Y'all, I apologize for skipping a week between episodes, but I kind of needed a couple of days to recover from Halloween. Ooh, you have no idea. It was a crazy, crazy weekend here in the French Quarter, but it was everything I could have hoped for and more. We wound up joining a few of our friends for cocktails and food and a party. And, well, in the process, I think we saw 789 witches, two literal dumpster fires, and countless crises. (laughs) But I'll tell you, my guy and I, we fit in just fine. Which, I have to admit, is a little bit of an unusual feeling for me. I've said this before. But most of my life, I've always kind of felt as though I was on the outskirts of pretty much everything. School, work, even friendships. Now, as an adult, I have learned to appreciate the distant place my kind of crazy takes in the world. But as a kid, I wanted nothing more than to fit in. And anywhere would have been fine, really. By the time I hit the middle of my freshman year of high school, I had hit up every club, group, and fringe outfit within my stupid little suburban town and either been laughed or unceremoniously booted out of them all. There was, however, one constant in all of my social wandering, and that was my friend Mark. He and I met in second grade when we were paired up for our school's Thanksgiving pageant, which was just as tedious and tacky as it sounds. He and I were two pilgrims relegated to the unlit corner of the stage, where we were instructed to provide atmosphere, while Aaron and Steve, the Ken and Barbie of our class, they led us through a dramatically inappropriate reenactment of the so-called original Thanksgiving feast. Mark and I spent the play trading jokes and making faces, and the highlight of the night was when he leaned over to whisper, You and I go good together. We're both weird. He was right on both accounts, and Mark quickly became my best friend. He even promised to marry me one day. It was a reasonable idea, one that I immediately agreed to, seeing as how, at 12, we both believed wholeheartedly that we would never meet anyone who would want to marry us otherwise. Only kids can have that kind of closeness without fucking it all up. Mark and I managed to keep it together through grade school and middle school. But high school, that brought a whole new set of complications. For starters, hormones were exceptionally kind to Mark. He pretty much went from just a cute kid to head-turningly handsome overnight. Kind of like Wesley from The Princess Bride, only with shaggier hair and a very long trench coat. The hair was my idea. I was trying to get him to grow it out like a rock star. And because Mark didn't really care how he looked, he agreed. And that's probably why he insisted on wearing his dad's old coat. It was a little too broad in the shoulders, and the cuffs fell way beyond his wrists. Then you add in the crumpled pack of cigarettes he always had, and the overall effect was that of a seriously sexy homeless man. I, well, I was not as fortunate. (laughs) My own look was a tragically mixed bag of pastels, neons, and a rapidly growing collection of band t-shirts. My attitude wasn't any better, and I'd show up at club meetings and tryouts like an angry Debbie Gibson who had been run over by a Motley Crue tour bus. Mark was the only person who knew what to do with me. He'd cheer on all of my fool's whims and then pick up the pieces after the inevitable rejections. By mid-November, I'd had enough. And the exact day is still just 
crystal in my mind because that was the day the school newspaper turned me down. Of course, since this is a high school volunteer club, they couldn't exactly outright ax me. No, I was more than welcome to attend meetings. But according to the shitty senior who ran the tight-knit program, my so-called writing perspective would never pass the editorial board. And you know what that translates to. She pretty much said, yeah, you're not our type. You never will be, so don't even bother trying. Fucking high school. My mother, who, by the way, was still disappointed that I didn't make the palm squad, She thought I should stick it out and learn their rules and play their game and work my way up their stupid little ladder. I thought they should all go fuck themselves. And Mark agreed, although for different reasons. He and I were huddled up together under the picnic awning at the park. And we had his ridiculous trench coat wrapped around the both of us to block the freezing wind. And I was raging, just raging, because I actually kind of wanted to write for the school paper. And my sample article was a scathing but very smart review of a recent pep rally. Mark read the article and the sorry not sorry note stapled to it, and he just said, fuck them, write for yourself. It was something that he had been saying to me for more than a year, but I didn't really know what it meant. To me, A writer is supposed to write something for something. So I'd been spending a fortune in dot matrix toner and postage to send articles to every publication I found in the library, regardless of whether or not I was qualified. And that meant there was zero distinctive focus or perspective to anything that I wrote. It was all just words put together reasonably well. Consequently, my budding writing career consisted of dead air and polite postcards. But that latest rejection from the school newspaper stung, and that was it. I was done, and I told Mark as much. He's quiet for a moment, and then he hands me his cigarette like it's a shot glass and instructs me to inhale. Everyone I knew smoked then. Family, friends. It was not the taboo thing that it is now, so. Taking the smoke just seemed like the natural thing to do. His cigarette is slightly crushed from his too deep pocket, but I'll tell you, I loved it. Oh, oh, did I love it. Mark was right when he said it would make me feel better. Sure, it burned like hell at first, but I adjusted, and I quickly found that the ritual of inhaling and exhaling was perversely satisfying. Plus, it kept me warm as Mark tried to convince me to not give up writing. He kept saying, write what you want, which in the ranks of kid wisdom is probably among the best advice ever offered. The only problem was that I still wanted the wrong things. Like Mark. (laughs) Oh, did I want Mark. Sweet, loving Mark who Wanted so much for me to be happy, he invited me to join a local theater group that he'd recently started hanging out with. Now, this wasn't a school-sanctioned group. It was the scrappy offshoot of a community theater troupe who was sponsored by the Historic Society. These 20 or so kids got free run of the stage on off nights in exchange for being ushers. He thought maybe I could write a monologue or a short scene for them after their current production ended. And I agreed to check it out, not because I cared about the theater or writing for it, but because I wanted the time with Mark. You see, he had scored a supporting role in their current production, so he'd been spending more and more time with the group. And I was jealous. Jealous like only a self-absorbed, blindingly insecure teenage girl can get. Because, of course, I was convinced I was in love with Mark. He wasn't like any other guy friend that I had, where everything that they did came with the thinly veiled hope of making out with me one day. With Mark, there was never any pressure. He'd hold my hand and it would feel smooth and comfortable, not sweaty and grabby. 
I never had to worry about his cock riding my leg if I went in for a hug. Friendship with Mark was open and effortless and so important to me that I did not want to share him with anyone. Least of all, a bunch of unknown kids who seemed to be making him, of all things, happy. Fuck that. Mark needed to be miserable with me, damn it. So I followed him to rehearsals the next day. This was the first full production the group was staging. Although calling it a production seemed like a bit of a stretch, seeing as how they weren't exactly acting. There were props and costumes, but the bulk of this production consisted of the cast reenacting scenes from a movie as it played. And that movie was Rocky Horror Picture Show. I'd only ever heard of Rocky Horror, and much of it was the same kind of speculation that surrounded skin flicks like Deep Throat and Debbie Does Dallas. That was a confusing contradiction because the one VHS copy of the movie that our mom and pop video store carried, they categorized it as horror. So I didn't know what to expect. Mark points me to a seat in the auditorium while they run through the show and promises to introduce me to everyone after. Watching Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time was a little bit like that first cigarette. It was love at first exhale. Everything about it appealed to me. Oh my God, I loved it. The camp, the sex. I could totally see why Mark was so happy here. He had the pivotal role of Rocky himself, the handmade blonde Adonis of Dr. Frankenfurter. And seeing Mark strutting around the stage, that immediately made him not just the object of my love, but of my lust. You gotta understand, he was, he was everything. He was sexy, but a little clumsy, confident, but endearing. This is a seriously intoxicating combination for any budding sexual being, let alone a deranged chick like me. I wanted to stand up and cheer every time he appeared on stage to let him know that, well, one, I was proud of him, but mostly two, that I was ready to murder anyone who got in between us like that little bitch playing Janet. Ooh, ooh, I hated her. I still hate her. I seethed during their big sexual awakening scene, just violently hating her with every fiber of my being as she writhed around on Mark. One chunk of my brain, the small but rational part, it just kept repeating, they're acting, they're only pretending, this is okay. But then the larger and more vocal chunk would chime in, and it wanted blood. I really did try to be nice when Mark introduced me to everyone after rehearsals. I mean, they seemed like good people, but Janet, oh, that clam, she drapes one arm over Mark's shoulder, leans into him and says, oh, so you're the little childhood friend we've been hearing so much about. Yes. Yes, I am. And if you do not appreciate the priority this gives me, I will peel the skin from your bitchy face. Not that I said that. I played nice. I talked about how great the show was and how excited I was for opening night. But later, on the way home, I couldn't keep myself from asking Mark, what the fuck is up with that Janet chick? He kind of sighs when I ask that, and he says, yeah, well, she's a little bit to handle sometimes, but, you know, she's okay. Had I been paying more attention to my friend and not the insane voices in my head, I would have heard the sadness in him then. Instead, all I processed was, good, he doesn't like her either. And it was that assessment that made it easier for me to accompany Mark to the next week of rehearsals. They all went the same. We'd hang out for a while first, plow through whatever snacks people thought to bring, and then I'd retreat to the audience to watch while they perform the show. And that fucking Janet. Ugh, you won't believe what she did. She would strip down to her bra and panties, regardless of the scene that they were working on and regardless of whether or not anybody else was in a costume, and she would just prance around the stage half-naked saying it helped her get into character. 
her figure was spectacular. I mean, it was in full bloom. So, of course, no one objected. For five fucking nights, I had to sit and watch her press her tits against my friend, smiling right at me as she did it, and pretend like it didn't matter at all. Mark was too nice of a person to do anything but downplay her panty-clad gyrations as being part of the show. But I knew better. She wanted him, and she was going to do everything she could to brand him as hers. And let me just say, that wasn't just the crazy voices in my head. I wasn't the only person thinking this. The guy who played the character Riff Raff, he joined me in the audience one night during the final rehearsal of the Touch Me number. He drops down into the seat next to me with a disgusted grunt, and he says, Oh, that girl would swallow our boy whole if she had the chance. He makes a mock machine gun with his hands and mimics blowing Janet off the stage. And it is a huge relief to realize that he hates her, too. Riff Raff and I trade a few insults, and just before he returns to the stage, he leans in close and he whispers, I'm glad Mark has you for a friend. He said it as a compliment, from one caring person to what he assumed was another. But I didn't hear it that way. No, in my brain, it was a call to action. Because for as brilliant of friends as we were, I knew, I knew we could be even better together as a couple. And it was time for me to let Mark know that. The show was set to open that Friday. As underage kids, they weren't allowed to follow tradition by performing at midnight. 8 p.m. was as late as they could push the show, and the tiny theater was nearly packed by 7. This was the first time Rocky Horror had been performed in our town, and everyone wanted in on it. Mark and I watched the crowd from backstage for a few minutes. His hands are shaking as he peers through the musty curtain, and he says, I can't believe I'm going to let people see me like this. I think he's referring to his costume. His entire body is wrapped in ace bandages then, which will be removed on stage to reveal his gleaming painted body wearing nothing but tiny gold spandex shorts. He looked amazing, which I tell him, but it doesn't seem to comfort him much. So I decide to reach into my purse and pull out a small wrapped package. I had planned on giving it to him after the show, but he seemed so scared and down that, well, I hoped what I was about to do would cheer him up. I tell him it's just a little good luck present and smile as he tears the paper away. He's left holding a gorgeous silver cigarette case. I'd found it trolling through one of the antique stores that he always dragged me to, and I immediately knew it would be perfect for him. The case is elegant in his hands as he turns it over to admire the etching, and I say, now you'll never have to give me a crushed smoke again. His face softens, and when I see the smile start to form on his lips, I can't help myself. I have to lean in and kiss him. I had been dreaming about kissing Mark for weeks, and as my lips first brush his, all I can feel is relief because, oh, thank God, I'm finally doing it. But the sensation changes and the kiss starts to feel not wrong exactly, but remiss. So I pull away and I look at Mark. I'm terrified and I'm wondering, was my best friend going to be the next in my long line of rejections? The look on his face is too conflicted to know for sure. Mark opens his mouth like he wants to say something, but he never gets the chance because Janet intervenes. She'd been watching us and is looking especially satisfied as she approaches. Her first act costume is supposed to be a prim assembly of polyester, but she's wearing the clothing like a cougar and just walking towards us tits first. She lays a hand on Mark's shoulder and says to me, you didn't really think that was going to work, did you? Quite honestly, I couldn't make sense of anything I was thinking right then. A hot, humiliated blush takes over my face while a conflicting jumble of love and anger throbs in my fingertips. 
Janet just drapes herself over Mark, who flinches as her hand caresses the back of his neck. She doesn't notice. She just says, he doesn't want you. Did he want her? Did he? We both look to Mark then, both of us blinded and confident of our singular importance in his life, and we officially demand confirmation. It's time, buddy. Make a choice. Who's it gonna be? Mark hovers just shy of panic. I don't need to see the tears in his eyes. I hear them in his voice as he breaks away and he yells, I don't want any of this. Janet and I watch as he darts off. She rolls her eyes and mumbles something about his loss, then regroups and sets her sights on the guy playing Eddie. Me, I know I've fucked up. Mark had needed a friend, not a conquest, and I failed miserably the second I let my lips get the best of me. I know I need to make things right, so I search the backstage, pressing past the cast and crew until I finally find Mark in a dark alcove. He's surrounded by scenery from the upcoming Christmas Carol production, and I'm about to go to him when I see that he isn't alone. Riff Raff is there, too. And with that, I understand exactly what Mark meant when he said he couldn't believe he was going to let people see him like this. Tonight wasn't Mark's debut as Rocky. It was his coming out. God, did I feel like an asshole. <laughs> Not because I didn't know that he was gay, but because I was too caught up in my own bullshit to give him the chance to tell me himself. I watch quietly as he and Riff Raff talk. Their heads are touching and there's an easy comfort to them that I envy. My friend... He'd figured out how he fit in. I was happy for him and a little sad for me. The curtain will be going up in just a few minutes, and I know that I need to say something now before the area is flooded with people. So I touch Mark's shoulder gently, and that beautiful face of his looks up at me, and before he can say anything, I just say, I am so glad you have a friend like Riff Raff. It wasn't everything that I wanted to say, but it was enough. That night, Mark was fantastic as Rocky. And in fact, it was a role that he would replay every November through his senior year. And I was always there for opening night. Obviously, we never married, but we did remain friends. It may have taken me a little while, but I found my own ways and the person that I fit in with. I even came to understand what Mark meant when he told me all of those times to write what I want. I'm guessing he didn't think it would one day be about him, but I'm pretty sure he'll be happy to cheer me on. That's just what friends do. Cheers, y'all. Ah, y'all, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Unwritable Rant podcast. If you want to know more about the bourbon that I'm drinking, Join me on Monday nights on YouTube. I go live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Central Time with my guy, David the Producer. And if you want to catch up on back episodes of this podcast, there are several ways you can do that, including a brand new way. My YouTube channel. <laughs> if you're hanging out on YouTube, I've got all of my back episodes listed there on my channel, which is youtube.com slash Juliet Miranda or... You can go to theunwritablerant.com, and the entire archive is there as well. In the meantime, my girlfriend Texas is joining me this weekend, and I am sure there are going to be stories to tell following that. So join me next Sunday. I'll be back with more Berman Soak stories. Cheers, y'all. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Yeah, he was pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to Bourbon? A couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. If it's all the same, what you say, bon ton. Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I 
I can hear the trombone every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this. Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you. Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss. You can be the flower on my magnolia. Every heart ought to be to a rhythm.